Hey, hey, a push Panthers. All right, today we're going to finish setting up the colonies. We're going to get the rest of the 13 colonies all in place. And most of these are, I have some pretty good stories to go, to go over them. It's not like, you know, Delaware or something. Actually, we are going to do Delaware, but um, they're going to be pretty interesting stories for the most part. So let's get to it. All right, so here's this fine-looking gentleman. His name is George Calvert, and he's a member of the House of the Lords, uh, House of Lords. So he's one of the, uh, he's a very powerful uh, Englishman, a very wealthy Englishman, a lot of power. And he's in the upper house of the parliament. His name is George Calvert. He's also a Catholic, and he's probably the most powerful, the most well-known Catholic in England. And Catholics are not liked at all in England. They are a very persecuted, very um, um, a group with a lot of prejudice against them. They're not treated well at all. So George Calvert asks King Jimmy if he can have a Catholic refuge and, and a, a Catholic colony in the New World. Well, Jimmy goes, this New World is working out great. We're getting rid of all these people we don't like in England. They're all going over there and they're all figuring out a way to make me money. He loves the idea. So Jimmy quickly agrees, let's roll out the map and let's send somewhere to send to, uh, send you and the rest of the Catholics. So in 1634, a group of Catholics, uh, settlers, land in the middle of Virginia and Massachusetts and established their colony. Now, they're Catholics. They're not going to name it after James, right, who's not a Catholic. They're going to name this colony after probably the most revered, most important figure in the Catholic Church after uh, Jesus Christ. Maryland, land of Mary. And it becomes a Catholic refuge. George Calvert names the capital city after his title. He is the Lord of Baltimore. So Baltimore becomes the capital of Maryland, a Catholic refuge, a Catholic haven in a new world. Well, it becomes a pretty, um, pretty successful uh, colony. It makes a lot of money. There's lots of fishing and lots of other opportunities, which means it's going to attract other people to the colony. So a lot of other religions begin to show up, mostly Anglicans. And the Catholics, can re they realize, gosh, what's about to happen? They're about to lose majority in their own colony. So before that happens, in 1649, the Maryland legislature passes a bill called the Maryland Toleration Act which basically protects the rights of all people to practice their religion as they want. You can't persecute, you can't be prejudiced against people simply because of their religion. Unless you're not Christian, but everybody's going to be Christian, right? As long as you believe in God, if you're one of those weirdos that says, oh, I don't believe in God, I'm, a, I'm an atheist, you know, then we might have problems. But as long as you worship God, you're, you're, you can practice your religion any way you want. So this was an attempt by the Catholics to protect themselves against prejudice and against um, bigotry in their own colony before they lose um, be, before they lose majority. Jews were tolerated. We don't like them, but fine, we'll take them. In 1654, the Anglicans and the Puritans become the majority uh, in Maryland, which means they become the majority in the state in Maryland legislature. And the first thing they do is nullify the Maryland Toleration Act. And Catholics, once again, go uh, become a very persecuted, very discriminated, discriminated against group in their own colony. <laughs> All right. So in 1663, Jimmy dies, and his uh, the guy who comes after him, King Chuck the uh, First. King Chuck the First has a lot of problems. Um, eventually, England decides 
they've had enough of him and they chop off his head and um, we get a new king. Yeah. Chuck II owes his crown. He became king because of eight very old, very wealthy men in England who supported him, who protected him, and pushed his name to become king. So he wants to reward, reward these eight old dudes who helped him become king. So he asked them, what can I do? Well, they wanted land in the, in the uh, New World. So he gives them land in the new, new World. Now, what these eight very old, wealthy guys want, they don't like the new times. They don't like the modern times. It's just, it just doesn't fit them. They want to go back to when men were men and women were women, I guess. They want to go back to the good old days of medieval times. They want to establish feudal estates, have be lords of the castle, have uh, serfs living out in the castle grounds working for them. They want knights in shining armor. They want to go back to those times. God, those were great times. So Chuck II gives them land in the new world to go establish their feudal estates. Okay. Because Chuck gave them this land, they named this um, colony, this land grant, after King Chuck, the Carolinas, because Charles was the Carolinian king. So they named this new settlement Carolina. And these eight old dudes are going to go and they're going to set up castles with feudal estates and they're going to have lords of the manor and knights and serfs. And it's going to be fantastic. Well, these guys die before they can ever get over here. They have a tough time finding people who want to be serfs. Nobody's really signing up to be that. So they never get here. But there's a land grant. They cut off. Uh, the southern half of Virginia to create this land grant of the of, uh, Carolina. So other Englishmen, knowing that there's an empty colony sitting over there, and these eight guys who you know are now toes to Jesus, they're not going to go. So they set sail there, looking for opportunity for a new start, for a fresh start. And where they land, they're going to name. Um, the town where they let where they land at and established their first settlement they're going to name it after charles charles town you can see it right down here charles town named after king charles eventually becomes charleston south carolina the carolinas become extraordinarily successful even more successful than virginia because Tobacco grows better, it turns out, in the Carolinas, and it does in Virginia. There's a lot more uh, tobacco in uh, the Carolinas than there is in Virginia. Um, other crops grow very well there as well. Indigo, which is used for dye. Uh, rice grows well there. And then cotton, which really doesn't grow very well in Virginia, grows really well in the Carolinas. Eventually, there will be a dispute over who should lead the Carolinas, and the Carolinas are eventually split into two different parts, South Carolina and then North Carolina. All right, the next guy. Oh, ho, 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 ho. So right in the middle of the colonies, there is a very large Dutch colony very prosperous Dutch colony called New Netherlands. And it drives the English crazy because it's right between Massachusetts and the New England colonies and Virginia. God, they, the English just hate the presence of the Dutch there. And that this is a very prosperous colony. It makes a lot of money in trading and in shipping. So it's called the New Netherlands. The City is a very, very large, uh, it's a very, fairly large city for the New World. It has a very deep natural port, meaning that ships of any size, it's easy for these ships to come in and out. And it didn't have to be built, really. It was just kind of there. And because of this, because of its ability to handle very large ships, there's a lot of commerce coming in and out 
of uh, this city. And it, it's called New, New Amsterdam. And it becomes a very wealthy city in the New World. Lots and lots of money there. So Chuck is going to send his brother, James, to the New Netherlands to get it. Now, the reason he sends James over there, James is a bit of an embarrassment for the crown. Um, he likes to gamble a lot. He likes to drink a lot. And he likes women. A lot. So he's just an embarrassment to the royal crown. So Chuck kind of wants to get him out of the country to stop embarrassing uh, the crown. And he sees this as an opportunity. He tells his brother Jimmy, look, go over to New Netherlands and take it over. One of two things is going to happen in this. One, he's going to go over there and he's going to actually be able to take over New Netherlands and claim it for England, which will be great for England because that just means more money. Or James will go over there and he'll die. Either way, at least for a period of time, Jimmy is out of England and not causing problems and an embarrassment. And hopefully he'll gain this for the crown. Now, the Netherlands, New Netherlands, is ruled by a very, very, very mean, uh, heartless, tough old bird. He's a Dutch governor. His name is Peter Stojanovic. And this is a picture of him here. This is Peter Stojanovic. And if you look, oh, yes, he does. He's got a peg leg. He literally has a peg leg. He was in a battle, uh, a naval battle, for the Dutch. and the bottom part of his leg was taken out by a cannonball. It literally, like the cannonball hit his leg and took it with him. So he's the, the Dutch governor of New uh, Netherlands, and he's obviously in New Amsterdam, and he is he's not a likable guy. People, The Dutch people there do not like him at all. So one day the British ships come sailing into the harbor, and here come the British Navy sailing into New Amsterdam's um, harbor. And Peter Stoyanovic can see them coming. And Peter Stoyanovic starts, you know, kind of half running, half hopping down the street, screaming at the Dutch people to come out and defend the Dutch colony. The British are here and grab your guns and grab your muskets and come and help us. And Peter Stoyanovic runs out to the dock to fight the British uh, ships, to meet the British warships with the Dutch colony behind, following behind him to fight the British as well. And as Peter Stoyanovic gets out to the dock, as the ships are coming in, he turns around and yell, to yell at the people, let's fight. And nobody came out. Because the Dutch people figured life under the British can't be any worse than life under Peter Stoyanovic. So nobody comes out to, to defend New Amsterdam or New Netherlands. And England takes over the colony without a shot being fired. They just show up and the Dutch pretty much give up because nobody was willing to fight if it meant keeping Peter Stoyanovic. So the English show up and they get it. Now, James, now that he's not going to stay New Netherlands, New Amsterdam, so he thinks, yeah, what should I call it? Jimmy Land. No, that, that's not going to work. And he thinks and he thinks and he thinks. Well, James is the Duke of York. So he calls it New York. And he calls the city, he liked the sound of that so much, he calls the city New York City after himself. So now... They've taken over, the English have taken over this very large, extraordinarily prosperous colony right in the middle, in between Virginia and New England. So Jimmy goes uh, back to England and he continues gambling and drinking and so on. And one day he's met by a friend who he owes a lot of money to because of gambling and drinking. And his friend wants to be paid back. But James says, you know what? I got something better. 
I just got some land over in, in the new world. What if I give you part of my colony and just cut off part of my colony and give it to you? And his friend goes, well, that's a pretty good idea. So he does. He cuts off part of, uh, part of this uh, southern part of his colony. He gives it to his friend. His friend, all right, you get to name things after yourself. His friend is the Duke of Jersey. We get New Jersey. Yay! All right, now this guy. Oh, this is a good story. So as despised as the Puritans and the Pilgrims and the Catholic were, we got rid of them for the most part. There is one more group that, God, the British hate. God, they would trade this group if it meant that they could bring back the Puritans and Pilgrims and the Catholics. Holy cow, do they hate this religious group. The Quakers. Now, you may have had a Quaker smiling at you this morning as you're eating your breakfast, right? Quaker oats and that, that's Quakers. They're called Quakers because uh, often during the their religious services, they would become so overpowered by the word of God that they would begin to shake as they're praying. So they become Quakers because they quaked. And the Quakers are really despised by the British because Quakers are pacifists. They don't believe in fighting. And so they never serve in the British military and they don't see any sense in, in going off to war. So that then stick well with the British because they like to fight, you know, the French and stuff. So the British really hate the Quakers. Leader of the Quakers is this guy whose picture you see there. His name is William Penn. And he's also in the House of Lords. And he goes to Chuck and says, look, you don't like us. We don't like being here, being persecuted. What if you gave us some land in the new world and I could take a bunch of Quakers over there and it becomes a refuge? for Quakers, just like a, a a getaway for Quakers. Chuck can't believe this, right? God, I get I get rid of more people I don't like? Fantastic. So they roll out the map and they find a place for William Penn to take his Quakers out of England and take them to the New World and establish a new colony for England. So there is a giant hole, now that they've got um, New York, there is a giant hole between New York and, um, and and the other colonies. So he's going to give them that that piece of land to fill in that piece of land on the Atlantic seaboard. So here's Virginia. Here's Maryland, right? We're all here. We've got all of this here, and we've got all of this here. So there's this big, gigantic piece right here that needs to be filled in. So in 1682, the first boat of Quakers arrives in the new colony. William Penn, he's going to name it after himself, Pennsylvania, land of Penn. The place that they land at, the first settlement, he calls Philadelphia, which is Greek for city of brotherly love, because the Quakers are also the most liberal, most open, most forgiving, most accepting uh, group in England. They like everybody and they want to get along with everybody and they think everybody should be able to do whatever they want to do. Like one, you know, they're like one giant boulder, like we're just all going to get along and we're going to wear a Birkenstocks. We're going to play the guitar and we're going to sing Kumbaya and it's going to be awesome. That's the Quakers. Penn calls this the, his holy experience because it's a place where he says anybody and he truly means Anybody can come and worship however they pleased, as long as they worship God. If you're a Jew, come on in. You're a Catholic, come on in. If you're a Puritan, come on in. You're an atheist, you need to go away. But everybody's going to be treated equally here. 
he writes what uh, he calls the frame of government or constitution and becomes the most liberal of all colonial constitutions. And it becomes the model for the United States Constitution in 1789. A lot of the United States Constitution, a lot of the ideas for it are going to come out of Penn's frame of government. He treats the Native Americans pretty well. He actually negotiates with them for land and um, allows them to live uh, as they've always lived for the most part. Uh, Pennsylvania is going to become the first uh, colony, before it's even a state, the first colony to have an abolitionist uh, organization in there to uh, call for the abolition of slavery. So it's a very, very, very progressive, very liberal uh, colony, by far the most liberal progressive colony in the, in the New World. 1704, there's some settlers uh, in Pennsylvania who are not real happy with Penn and the Quakers. And so they leave and they create their own colony of Delaware. And that's all we'll say about Delaware. In 1730, England's going to get a new king, King George. And this will be the king who will be here for the American Revolution. Now, King George at this time he is a pretty likable guy. And he's not crazy, which he eventually will become very, very crazy. So in, uh, another nobleman in England, his name by the name of George Oglethorpe, goes to sing King George. And he wants a, a land grant where he can take a bunch of poor people, to clear out more poor people, which are dragging down the economy because the crown has to support them and feed them and clothe them and so on and so forth. What if we take a bunch of these poor people out and we take them to the new world and set up a, a, a colony just for them so they can get a fresh start on life and maybe make you more money. Well, King George, like his predecessors, they loves this idea. We can get rid of people that we don't want here and send them over there and make us money. Sign me up. George is also very worried about the Spanish who are down in Florida. And the Spanish are in the beginnings of a what will become a very, 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 very long uh, tragic death of their empire. They're running out of money. They're desperate for money. Remember, they were down here stomping around looking for gold. There's no gold down there. And he's very worried that the Spanish here could come up into the Carolinas and um, invade and attempt to take over the Carolinas because the Carolinas were very, very, very profitable. So he's worried about the Spanish coming up. So he's going to give George Oglethorpe a, a, a piece of land that essentially is going to be a cushion between the Carolinas and Florida. George Oglethorpe is going to name this colony after King George, right? Thank you. I'm going to name this after you. And they established Georgia. And George Oglethorpe will show up in 1732 with a lot of poor people. They've going, they're going to land uh, in at present day Savannah. That's going to be their first settlement. And as it turns out, Georgia becomes an enormously successful colony as well, making a lot of money. And so now we've got our 13 colonies stretching all the way from here, all the way up here. Now, this is Maine. Maine is not going to become a state quite yet, but it's owned by Massachusetts. It's very weird. Massachusetts is here, and then there's New Hampshire here, and then on the other side of New Hampshire, Massachusetts again. Massachusetts is basically split into two parts. But all of these colonies now become very successful and make a lot of money for England in timber. Not a lot of forests left in England at this time, not enough to build the Spanish Navy and trade ships. Uh, in fishing, a lot of cod fishing, a lot of uh, um, crab fishing, a lot of fishing takes place off of the coast here. Obviously, tobacco and uh, cotton and indigo, a lot of rice will come out of here. 
Um, a lot of cereal crops, a lot of wheat and stuff is going to be uh, come out of here. So all of these colonies are going to become enormously, enormously profitable for England. And we're done with all of the colonies. So now we get to start building up to when the colonies no longer want to be a part of England. And that's all the notes for now. Take care.